Audio testing, testing, main microphone audio, one, two, three. Audio testing, lapel mic one, testing one, two, three. Audio testing, lapel mic two, one, two, three, testing. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Green zone. Okay. Uh, 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick word before we get going. Uh, I'm David, and I work with Russell on running the library here. One thing I wanted to point out to you all, you're all extremely welcome, and we really appreciate you turning up. Can I point out that the library is a free, it's a free library that's open to all. This event tonight costs a fair amount of money to put on. We are very grateful to all of you who give us donations. And if any others of you would like to give us donations, we're at the back uh, where we're selling the book, where we're sending cards and et cetera, all these other things. But you can also give us a donation there as well. The other thing I wanted to point out to you all is that tonight's event is going to be recorded. It's going to be a podcast. So by not leaving the library now, you are agreeing to be recorded. And I hope that's okay with you all. I think the only other thing I have to point out to you is that there's a fire exit over here. And now I'm going to hand you over to the keeper of the library, Russell Napier, and our guest, Simon Clark. Thank you, David. Welcome, everybody, back to the Library of Mistakes. Summer is over. All your summer mistakes can be left behind. They're all done with. Uh, so just a brief introduction to the library for those of you who haven't been before. We are a, pub we are a library. Open to the public. We are open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Saturday. It's free, so if you're just here and you haven't actually already registered, please register on the libraryofmistakes.com. You will then get invites to all of these uh, lectures, and you will also get notified when we do the podcasts. And uh, if you want to come along, you just simply have to uh, arrange a visit, and you'll be here by yourself, really. We don't have a unstaffed library. You buzz the door, and you'll be let in, but you have to arrange a visit if you want to come and spend some time here. Usually there's a great big desk, series of desks right down the middle. We're in library mode and not lecture mode. So, lectures. Well, tonight is a very special night. We're delighted that Simon Clark has come and joined us because he's about to tell you a story. And the title says it all, I think, because you have in the title. No, it's okay. I can, I can read the title. The subtitle. How the Global Elite Was Duped by a Capitalist Fairy Tale. So, as Simon is talking, I want you to think about Hans Christian Andersen because that's what I thought about when I was reading this book. Sometimes fiction or fact is strange than fiction. Simon is a journalist. He's been a journalist since he was that height. He got, until recently working for the Wall Street Journal. It's taken him all over the world to the poppy fields of Afghanistan, the copper mines of Congo, and the city of London. And we'll let you explain how, you, how the, the similarities, perhaps, between all of those three things. But anyway, let's hear about this great capitalist fairy tale. And then we'll, I'll ask a few questions to Simon. And as you know, if you're regular attendees, uh, you can ask some questions as well. Simon. <coughs> Thank you very much, Russell. It's great to see you all. It's great to be in Edinburgh. How to describe this story? Many ways. Um, but let's start by saying this is a story about inequality, the vast inequality in the world, and the possibility of, of reconciling the extremes, extremes which you know, I've seen in my life and wanted to see, um, I've been a journalist at, at Bloomberg News and the Wall Street Journal, also written for the Financial Times. Uh, and over 20 years as a financial journalist, I've written about billions and trillions of dollars, uh, how, how money moves around the world, who moves money around the world, who benefits from that, and sometimes who doesn't benefit from that. Before that, um, in the 90s, I, I had... For brief period, but very important periods of time, I, I taught in northern Pakistan and also in a school in a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. So I made friends with and taught and learned from people who lived on a dollar a day or a couple of dollars a day. Um, and the extremes between wealth and, and poverty always really preoccupied me. Um, which is why Abraj was so fascinating to me. Because Abraj's promise was that it could use money to bridge the divides between the rich and the poor in a way that would be beneficial for both. So Abraj was 
a private equity firm. It was based in Dubai, and in early 2018, which is when the story I'm going to tell you really, really begins, it was managing about $14 billion. Um, it was managing money on behalf of banks like Bank of America, billionaires like Bill Gates, um, governments, like so the British government, the US government, the French government. Um, and it had raised this money from these various investors by saying that it could make profit um, at the same time as helping to end poverty across Africa, Asia, and Latin America by investing in companies, all kinds of companies, pharmaceuticals companies, food companies, logistics, um, and creating jobs, creating services, um, making a better world. And Abraj did have some investment successes, so it had a track record. Um, and it also had a very charismatic founder, um, Arif Nakvi. So Arif was born in, in Karachi in, in Pakistan in 1960. He went to Karachi Grammar School, which was founded by the British in the late 1800s. Um, and then he went to London School of Economics. Uh, after that, he trained as an accountant to Arthur Anderson, um, started various companies in, in, in the Gulf. Um, and in early, the early 2000s, he founded Abraj. Um, Abraj grew to be you know, the main private equity firm in, in the Middle East. Um, its first big investment was in a company called Aramex which was like the, the FedEx of the Middle East. It was, a, it was a good company, it was a successful company. It had been listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange. Its shares collapsed after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks on New York. Arif and his partners bought the company, took it private, re-centered it in Dubai, expanded it across Egypt, Saudi Arabia, other countries with the management and sold it for a multiple of what they'd paid a few years later. It made a big success. Um, but in the mid-2000s, Arif realized that in addition to raising money from investors, billionaires, wealthy families, banks, pension funds, he could also raise money from Western governments, which were looking for ways to channel capital into developing markets. Um, so the British government has a fund called, it's now called British International Investment. Till recently it was called CDC, um, which invests in private equity funds in developing markets. This fund invested tens of millions of, of pounds of British taxpayers' money in, in a branch. The US government has a similar fund, did the same. So anyway, uh, January 2018, I'm working at the Wall Street Journal with Will Louch, who's the co-author of the book, The Key Man. Um, and we both specialize in writing about private equity. Um, Arif, in January 2018, is at the World Economic Forum in Davos. He's a big fixture at Davos, a barge paid millions of dollars on, on, on sponsorship and attending the World Economic Forum and, and other financial forums. Um, and in this particular year, he's speaking on a panel about how to extend healthcare across the world. Um, on that panel with him is, is Bill Gates. There's about f five people on this panel. Uh, Arif is sitting at one end. And, and Bill Gates is sitting at the other end. <laughs> Hello, Bill. <laughs> Hello, come in. That's okay. That's all right. We've started, but there are still finds of empty seats. Now you can find you can find a video of this lecture of, the, of this of this panel discussion online. Leave it, let's leave it slightly. And now now I'm talking about it. You'll be able to see that. Bill Gates is pretty uncomfortable. 
doesn't really want to be on this panel, doesn't want to be talking to Arif for an hour at the World Economic Forum, or that's what it looks like. So around this time, we receive the Wall Street Journal an email from someone who won't give their name. And this person, after a few emails exchanged, explains that they are an employee at a branch, and there's a problem. $200 million has gone missing from the billion dollar healthcare fund that um, Bill Gates, the World Bank's IFC unit, the British government have invested in. And they say this money has, in effect, been misused by a barrage to fund salaries, working capital um, of the private equity firm when it's supposed to be used to buy and build hospitals and clinics in, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, and in India. Uh, this is a pretty big allegation. Like, if you're specializing in writing about private equity, to be told that a firm has taken money out of an investment fund and is using it to pay salaries and bonuses and other expenses. This is a private equity firm that put on a famous investor forum in Dubai each year where once Tina Turner sang, and that's not going to be cheap. Um, you know, if you're a journalist, you start asking, well, where's the money gone? And was this the source of all that conspicuous spending over all these years? Anyway, you can't, as a journalist, write a story when you have an anonymous source who is making an allegation but isn't providing any documentary evidence. So we knew that if we could verify what this anonymous person was saying, this would be a big deal. Yeah, the money of Bill Gates, the money of the British government, was not being used for what the firm managing that money said. That's, that was the allegation, and that's where it started. So we started calling hundreds of people, basically. Um, we started off by calling contacts who were investors in Abraj's funds, some employees at the firm. Um, and it was clear that something was not right. Um, but it took a couple of weeks before we had enough <coughs> sources, enough people who had direct knowledge of what was going on, to publish a story. And our first story was published in, in February 2018. And we could only report what we could, what we were confident was true. And at that point in time, what we knew was that investors in the billion dollar healthcare fund were investigating whether $200 million of their money had disappeared. And so that's what we wrote. We called up a Braj, obviously, beforehand, spoke to a senior American executive at the firm who had former, formerly been the US government's representative on the board of the World Bank. And he said, absolutely not. This is not true. Why would a global firm like us do a thing like that? And if you're a journalist and you're going to report something as serious as this, there's always a risk of litigation. So. You always need to get your facts right, because that's the right thing to do. But you also need to get your facts right so that you're not sued. Um, so we knew that we had our facts right. And we published this story on February the 2nd, I think it was, 2018. Sometime after, it wasn't that long after, but it was after, the New York Times published a similar story. Um, Abraj, Arif, and his colleagues were inundated with hundreds of telephone calls from around the world from their investors and their bankers saying, we've read these stories. In the electronic age, news goes everywhere immediately. So suddenly, everyone who knew Abraj was reading these stories. Uh, and basically, the question was, like, what's going on? Are these stories for real? Abraj told 
its investors and its bankers that this was fake news, that this was not true. Now, it would be unusual for the Wall Street Journal to write fake news. <laughs> and it would be unusual for the New York Times to write fake news. And it would be very unusual for them to write the same piece of fake news, <laughs> given that they compete with each other, and nothing would give either newspaper much more pleasure than their rival getting caught publishing fake news. Because it wasn't fake news. Um, what, in effect, happened over the next few months in 2018 was there was a run on a barrage. Um, it's the lenders wanted their money back and certainly didn't want to lend any more money. And investors wanted their money back. Or they certainly wanted to know where their money was. Um, and we, as reporters, were pretty taken aback by the scale of the story, the amount of interest. Um, and we didn't really know what, what was coming in the sense that we, in effect, spent the rest of 2018 writing and reporting about a barrage. Um, what soon happened was we were tipped off that money had gone missing from a second abroad fund and then from a third abroad fund. And in addition to people giving us off-the-record interviews, telling us what was happening, we were starting to receive documents. So we had documentary evidence. And as we got these, these documents, we were able to write more and more stories. Um, Abraj was trying to, first of all, save itself and then sell itself. But as the story snowballed, its options got more and uh, more and more, more complex. Um, why does this matter? It really does matter. Um, Abraj was an early mover in impact investing. It was a prototypical ESG firm. It was a firm which said it could make money and do good. It could help end poverty, it could help solve environmental problems through its investments, through the power of money. Money wouldn't be the marker of wealth and poverty, but money could be a tool for creating a better society in a way that the wealthy wouldn't have to, to pay in a way that they would get no financial return. And, and what's not to like about that proposition? You know, you can get rich and, and do good. It's a, it's a great idea. And I'm sure it's possible, but it's not easy. Um, and I think we need to take a closer look at what happened here so we can learn from the mistakes. And that's why I'm so glad to be talking here today at the Library of Mistakes, because in 23 years as a financial journalist, I've learned that the finance industry doesn't like to talk about what it gets wrong. And they will do a lot not to talk about what went wrong. Um, financial firms have an army of public relations executives working for them and armies of lawyers. And if you're a journalist asking difficult questions, you're, you're on the receiving end of those public relations executives and lawyers. Uh, and it can be really challenging to, to have conversations about what went wrong. Uh, why does that matter? Because if we can't talk about what went wrong, we can't learn from it. And if we can't learn from it, it means these mistakes are probably going to happen again. Um, so what went wrong at Abraj? It managed $14 billion in January of 2018. Its CEO was a financial celebrity in the world of money, financial television, CNBC, Bloomberg, the likes. He was a recognizable personality. Wasn't necessarily famous in the wider world, but in the world of money, he was well known. Um, he had Bill Gates as an investor. This billion-dollar healthcare fund was, you know, 
presented at the World Economic Forum as an important part of a solution to providing healthcare services to people in countries where there wasn't much of a healthcare service. Um, the problem was, so let's just talk about the healthcare fund for a minute. Billion dollars was raised. Um, it was a for-profit fund. So the fund had to make a profit to be successful, to be viable. In order to make a profit, um, it had to invest in for-profit hospitals. That means that the hospitals had to charge their customers. Now, the problem in countries like Kenya and Nigeria and Pakistan is that very poor people just don't have any money. So how are they going to pay for healthcare services? Now, you might say to me that I'm making an obvious point, but that didn't stop Abraj from being able to raise a billion-dollar for-profit healthcare fund. So on the way up, as this fund was being raised, the Abraj executives and its investors, including the Gates Foundation and Medtronic and Philips, which are two very large publicly traded companies, were very open, were very public about the mission, the excitement, the journey, about what was achievable. By June or July of 2018, Abraj had filed for provisional bankruptcy and no one wanted to talk about it anymore. What gives? What happened? I mean, if this is a public initiative to promote the common good globally on the way up, why can't we talk about it on the way down? Now, I understand why private investors and private companies don't really want to talk to a journalist even if they were talking publicly before the collapse of the firm happened. But I found it harder that public funds investing my money, your money, our taxpayer funds, didn't want to talk about what had happened when it went wrong. And the most extraordinary response I ever received from a Freedom of Information request was from the British Government Fund, which at the time was called CDC, uh, it's now called BII. Um, so I made a Freedom of Information request for information about Abraj. Uh, and they responded that the public interest in not answering my questions was greater than the public interest <laughs> in answering my questions. I wrote back to them saying, I, I don't agree. And they didn't change their mind. Uh, after you've written twice, you can complain to the information officer. I did that. The information office upheld CDC's response, so that was the end of the process. So, uh, so we had to write a book about it, so you can all know about it. <laughs> and perhaps, you know, if you want to write to BII as well, you're, you're very welcome. I'll come back to why BII told me that, that they, why they gave me that answer uh, a bit later. Um, so, you know, when I was teaching in Pakistan, I'm seeing a country where there isn't much money. And um, one of the biggest companies in Pakistan is, is, is called Karachi Electric. It's the main power provider to Karachi, which is the biggest city in Pakistan. It's the industrial heartland of the country. And Abraj owned it. Um, and under Abraj's ownership, initially, there were some improvements, genuine improvements, which were made. And thanks to Arif's brilliant networking, he managed to get a lot of publicity for that, including Harvard, Harvard Business School case studies, which were effusive, incredibly positive. Um, the problem was that that wasn't the whole story. As, as our reporting showed, um, there was serious, serious mismanagement of, of the investment in Karachi Electric. Um, one of the things we uncovered was 
emails where payments to the former prime minister and his family were discussed from abroad. And, uh, you know, when Arif was talking publicly around the world, he was always very, you know, very explicit about never, never paying bribes. Um, the emails which our sources, you know, shared with us ultimately showed that on many occasions what Abraj was doing was very different from what it was saying. And, and, and this is why we were so determined to report report this story um, out. Um, the reason why British, the British International Investment said that the public interest in, in not answering our questions was greater than answering them was explained to me later by, by an executive at the firm. You said that after it collapsed, there were a lot of lawsuits going on around the world. Um, and talking, making, making these issues public wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful to their efforts to recoup these funds. So the, the priority of the investors was to try and get as much money back as possible from this situation. You know, Braj, had a billion dollars of debt when it, when it collapsed. And what happened was that various assets that it owned had been used to secure multiple loans. So it was a, a big mess. Um, this is just a small part of the Abraj structure. Now, Abraj said that it was regulated in Dubai. Uh, and it was very proud of the fact that it was, it was like one of the first firms to be regulated by the Dubai Financial Services Authority. Um, the problem was that wasn't entirely accurate. One, one of the Abraj units, called Abraj Capital, was regulated in Dubai. But the main parts of the firm, Abraj Holdings and Abraj Investment Management Limited, were incorporated in the Cayman Islands. And they were outside of the regulate, Dubai regulators' remit. So again, what Abraj was saying, you know, we are regulated by the Dubai Financial Services Authority, wasn't entirely the, the whole truth. Um, and after Abraj collapsed, the Dubai Financial Services Authority um, wrote a couple of reports on, on what went wrong, and it made this point: was look, we actually. We didn't regulate the whole firm. Uh, it's good to know after the event, I guess. They fined Abraj hundreds of millions of dollars, but Abraj didn't have the money left, so the fine's unpaid. So how did this all go missing? Um, Arif was very charming. He was a great networker. He was on the board of the UN Global Compact, which is supposed to advise the UN Secretary General on how private capital can be deployed to help end poverty. He was also on the board of the Interpol Foundation, which is part of the global police organization, Interpol, and its purpose is supposed to be to raise funds for Interpol. Um, we published a big front page feature explaining what happened at Abraj in October 2018. So hundreds of millions of dollars had been taken out of Abraj's funds, put in a secret bank account, and then hundreds of millions of dollars had then been sent to Arif's bank accounts and companies offshore. And, and six months after we wrote that story, Arif was flying from Pakistan to London. As he got off the plane, he was arrested by, by a, a British police officer. When the British police officer said to Arif, you know, Mr. Narkvi, you're under arrest, Arif's response was, you know, you can't arrest me because I checked with Interpol before I got on the plane <laughs> and there's no red notice for me. A red notice is an international arrest warrant. Now, remember, Arif had been on the board of the Interpol <laughs> Foundation. The Secretary General of Interpol had spoken at his investor conferences. <laughs> 
So he thought he was confident about what Interpol was doing. The policeman said to him, he didn't need a red notice to arrest him, and he was indeed under arrest. <laughs> and then he sent him to Wandsworth Prison, which is not a nice place. Um, so at that point, we're in early 2019, the Department of Justice has criminally indicted Arif and five of his colleagues um, for various alleged crimes, fraud, theft, attempted bribery. Arif maintains he's innocent. He still says he's innocent. Um, two of his colleagues have pleaded guilty. Um, Arif's trial has still not happened in New York um, because, uh, as far as we know, he's still living at his home in South Kensington. Now, after he was arrested in early 2019, um, he applied for bail. He had a hearing at Westminster Magistrates Court. Initially, his lawyers offered, I can't remember the exact figure, a million pounds, went up to a couple of million pounds, judge still refused. Then, I guess, proving that money talks better than any lawyer, his team offered 15 million pounds for bail, and he got bail. Um, at the time, it was the highest bail bond um, offered in the UK. Then his extradition trial began, and this has been going on, this went on for years, uh, but eventually the judge said that he should be extradited to New York to stand trial. The Home Office said he should go to stand trial. Um, he, Arif appealed against this judgment in the High Court. The appeal was heard earlier this year. A High Court judge said, no, his appeal is rejected. As far as we know, he's still uh, living in South Kensington. Um, we don't know why. It could be, in, in other cases, uh, people whose extradition has been ordered have appealed for asylum, political asylum. It's possible that that's what's happening, but we don't know. Um, so the wheels of global justice move, move very slowly. Um, I've continued to report about this, this story even after the book was published. The book was published in the middle of 2021. Uh, in the middle of last year, uh, I published an article in the Financial Times about how Arif had been funding Imran Khan the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, in a way that was not, uh, didn't appear to be in compliance with the electoral laws of Pakistan. So only Pakistani citizens are allowed to fund Pakistani politicians, but there was a flow of money through one of Arif's companies, which was originating from companies and foreign individuals going to uh, PTI, to Imran Khan's party. Um, in addition, earlier this year, Oxfam published an investigation into private healthcare services in developing countries. The report's called Sick Development. And it showed that the hospital in Nairobi, which Abraj owned, uh, Nairobi Women's Hospital, had been imprisoning patients because they weren't paying their bills, because they were too poor. So some patients had been, you know, locked up in hospital for months. Dead bodies were being withheld from relatives because bills weren't being paid. Um, so a really tough situation. So how was it that um, people bought into this idea that a for-profit hospital could... Um, could deliver services to people who don't have much money. 
It's a good question. It's a question that we've asked those investors and, 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 and answers are not particularly forthcoming. There were a lot of very famous firms which advised Abraj over the years, which invested in its funds. So McKinsey was very, very close to Abraj. Harvard Business Studies, case studies about Abraj. Uh, Freshfields law firm worked for Abraj. You know, all the big banks lent money to Abraj over the years. Um, you know, Abraj made a pitch which many wealthy people and big firms wanted to believe, that money could solve social and environmental problems. It can, money can play this role, but it can only play this role if real accurate information is provided about the scope of those problems. If people who live on very low incomes don't have any input into the way that money is deployed, then it's unlikely that money is going to be deployed in a way that is helpful to people who live on low incomes. But if someone comes along and pitches a dream that we all want to believe, that hundreds of millions of dollars can be channeled to solve social problems and earn a profit, then it appears there's enough very wealthy people in the world to believe that to support a firm like a branch. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, just, can you just put the corporate structure one back up again? So I have the advantage of being very close to this, so I can see all the company, all the countries the way over here. It's mainly the Cayman Islands. Yeah. Tunisia, Morocco, Brunei, India, Cayman, Africa, South Asia, and Scotland. So uh, if there's any corporate lawyers in here who ever incorporated something called Kantara, can you come and see me afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> Scotland. Uh, so... I suspect that every one of these entities probably had an accountant or an auditor, is that right? Or Absolutely. So would you like to name some of the auditors? I think we should be told who, who audited these companies. So people ask about red flags, which is a good question. Um, Abraj, as a company, was a constellation of companies, which was convenient. Uh, but many of those companies were audited by KPMG, most of the funds were audited by KPMG, and a lot of the portfolio companies were audited by KPMG. Um, Although, our, although our, accountancy firms are available. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, Arif was a good friend of the, the head of KPMG in the UAE, and the CFO of Abraj, his CV looks like this. I think he was at Abraj, then he was at KPMG. No, he was at KPMG, then he was at Abraj, then he was at KPMG, then he was at Abraj. Okay. So, so there were lawyers behind all of this as well? Can we name some of the lawyers, the law firms that did the documentation for these various issues? Freshfields was, was, did a lot of work for, for Abraj. So Bill Gates, the British government, the well, American gotcha. government, Freshfields, KPMG... McKinsey, and all um, of them didn't see it. Well, I mean, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and the regulator, uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with Dubai. The regulator didn't inquire about the subsidiaries or other companies. I mean, it was pretty obvious that they existed. Uh, well. As I said, I mean, after posthumously, so the regulator that moved was the, the US Department of Justice and the SEC. So April 2018, the DOJ came out of a criminal indictment and the SEC fi filed a civil suit against Abraj as well. Abraj, prior to its collapse, executives would say you know, we're regulated in six jurisdictions. Um, it appears only one of those jurisdictions was really on the case. Now, why would, why would the US regulator move? Because public pension funds, Washington State Pension Fund, Texas Teachers Pension Fund, Hawaii Pension Fund, New York Pension Fund, were investing public workers' pensions in a branch. And US regulators 
take that seriously. US government was also an investor in, in the healthcare fund. It's never a good idea to tell the US government that you're going to invest in hospitals and then when you receive a payment from the US government, do something else with their money. They, they don't like that. Um, you would imagine that was true in other countries, which were also investing in a branch, but it, it was the US that, that moved. Posthumously, the Dubai regulator did an investigation, which they published, which is very interesting. And, and as I said, one of the things they're saying is, actually, we, we, we regulated a barrage capital. We didn't regulate the fund management company, which was managing billions of dollars. That was in Cayman. There were other red flags. I mean, are if There were other red flags, including this whistleblower email, which a couple of months before the whistleblower, we don't know if it's the same one, got in touch with us, got in touch with investors. Um, so this, this is the email which went in September 2017 to, to investors. This email is basically saying, don't believe anything Abraj tells you. They're not using the money that you gave them for the purpose they said. You know, the financial accounts are all made up. Don't believe the slides and presentations or any information which comes. <laughs> Diligence it yourself with primary data and you will find the truth. After this email was received, a question was asked to Arif. He said, this is outrageous, this is ridiculous, don't believe it. Uh, and life carried on. Um, so how, what changed? What happened? Um, one of the things that happened was an executive from the Gates Foundation called Andrew Farnham. In September, he decided to ask Abraj where, where they were keeping the money that they were sending for the healthcare fund. He, he was looking through the accounts somewhat more attentively perhaps than others. And he could see that they were asking investors to send a lot of money but didn't seem to be immediately investing it in hospitals and clinics. So he was wondering, well, where are you keeping the money? The answer he initially got was um, it's being kept in an account uh, at the Commercial Bank of Dubai, I think it was, in, in, in Dubai. And then a couple, a couple of weeks later, he asked the question again, and this time he was told it's being kept at Standard Bank in the Cayman Islands. At which point he was like, well, you're a money management firm and you don't appear to know where the money you're managing is. And that's when the alarm bells went off for him. And then he and other investors, which included the IFC, the UK's CDC, BII, the US, and the French, started to investigate. Um, but during that process of investigation, a, a pattern emerged. So a couple of other executives of these, you know, mid-level executives of these investment firms started to ask questions to Abraj. And what happened was, on more than one occasion, their questions got escalated to Arif, and then Arif would call up a, senior, a more senior executive at the investment firm and say, you, you know, your junior colleague is asking us these questions which are frankly offensive. Like, really, you should apologize. This is so insulting. And a couple of them did apologize <laughs> immediately. And, you know, there are these mechanisms, there are these dynamics in finance, these sort of power dynamics in the hierarchies of firms that are not much discussed, but they are the, the, they are the enemies of truth, they are the enemies of accuracy, they are the anim enemies of good investing, these dynamics, and they are also the enemies of money actually being deployed in a way that is genuinely useful to people and planet. So th this is the email that says the king has no clothes, and the answer was, oh, yes, he does. And people said, yeah, he does. Yes. Yeah. Now, Arif's history was he left Pakistan as a young man to become an accountant in London, returned to Pakistan, said he'd passed his accountancy exams, yeah. but hadn't. Yeah. There were then every, every I think the RMX deal was a, was a it was. deal. It was a good deal. But basically every business partner told people not to deal with this man because he 
I'd love to try. So, the, I mean, the red flag started quite early. So, there were many former investors who had an issue. Uh, just before Arif started Abraj, he, he was running another investment company called Capola from Dubai, which bought a piece of Inch Cape, which was a, a venerable old British, maybe even Scottish company, I'm not sure. Um, it, you know, it had transported tea on wooden ships in the 1800s, and then it, was, it had sold cars around the world. It, and it was running groceries and selling liquor across the Arabian Peninsula. <laughs> and, and Arif did a, lever, a, br a brilliant leverage buyout of the, 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 the groceries and the liquor companies in the Gulf and made a lot of money out of it. Um, but the, the, some of the investors were very unhappy with him. And they felt they weren't getting from the deal what they had expected. Um, and this story of the Inch Cape deal was actually told by one of early, Arif's early partners in a book called Leverage in the Desert, which was self-published. But it is available. It's publicly available. And it, and it tells the story of, 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 of what happened. And it was published... I can't remember exactly when, but fairly sure it had been published by 2015. So it was available for any investor in a branch to read. I don't know if many, if any, read it. And at balance sheet date, which is the important date, these funds, they, they didn't have the money, but they did have the money. It seemed to appear from somewhere, from an airline. That's right. <laughs> so... So when Andrew Farnham asked, where's the money? He'd been told it was in the Commercial Bank of Dubai. Then he was told it's in Standard Bank. And he said, like, like, okay, this is ridiculous. I want to see all of your bank statements going back for months, a year, two years. In response to that, Abraj sent him a bank statement for one day. It was, I think, December the 7th, 2017. <laughs> and, and on this day, the Abraj uh, Healthcare Fund, according to this bank statement, had $225 million in it. Uh, which was true, it did. The trouble was that a week or so before that, it only had about $10 million. <laughs> and... Arif had arranged for a loan from Air Arabia, which is a low-cost airline, which Abraj was an investor in, and Arif was a director of. He asked for a, a short-term loan from the airline to this fund. So the money arrives from the airline, is deposited in the fund a few days before December 7th. So on December 7th, hey, presto, there's you know, lots of money in the fund. A few days after December 7th, the loan is repaid. The money leaves the fund, goes back to the airline. Now, it turns out that this, this accounting trick, which is called window dressing, had been going on for years. In fact, not with Air Arabia, but in other ways, Abraj had been playing this shell game for a very long time. And it had sort of mastered this art with other funds so that for various of its funds at the end of the financial reporting period, like June the 30th, it was moving money in just a few days before and then moving money out. And then the accounts were being looked at by the auditors, which was KPMG, and they were saying, OK, like, nothing to see here, all good. So uh, these, uh, these we all know these funds get high fees, but even these exceedingly high fees weren't big enough to cover the operating expenses of the fund. But there were other things. Uh, how much was the yacht? Again, I've forgotten how much the yacht cost. Uh, it was tens of millions of, yeah. of pounds. But nobody asked why he had a yacht with tens of millions of pounds. I mean, okay, fair enough, he has a yacht. Um, the question, the issue was that Braj was, was very conspicuous in, in Dubai. It was very glamorous. It put on amazing parties. They sponsored the, 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 the art prize every year in Dubai. Uh, it was the place that people craved to work 
in Dubai. It was like a, a Goldman Sachs. It was very prestigious. And people did think, wow, this firm puts on great parties and, 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 and its senior executives have an amazing life. And is it really earning that much money? In fact, in, employees used to joke about the money came, the Abraj had a magic money tree. It did have a magic money tree. It was called its investors. Um, well, you know, the victims in the financial world, people who work in finance would think about the victims as, as the investors, perhaps the banks that lent money and didn't get it back. And that, that's true. But also, you know, there are billions of people in the world who don't have health care. They don't have enough to eat. Uh, they don't have adequate housing. It would be great if our capitalist system could come up with sustainable, real solutions uh, for these people. Um, and if promises are made to all of us and our taxpayer money is used to support these promises, then there's a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the people who make those promises to fulfill their commitments. And if they cannot fulfill their commitments because something goes wrong that was unexpected, then I, fair enough. Tell us what happened. We made this promise, something unexpected happened. We can't fulfill our commitments because this, this and this happened. You know, I, I, I personally would respect an, a firm which did that and which did that with integrity. If their answers were, 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 were demonstrably true and if they could come up with a solution to that problem, then I, I'd like to think that I would then back them with more money. But if we have a financial system where problems get buried, uh, it's not great for the financial system. It's not great for the cause of global justice. It's not great for the planet. It's not great for humanity. And, and, and these are things that I think we all care about. And if we care about justice, we care about the environment, then we need to take much more interest in the firms that are running the global financial system, that are participating. This, you know, we have a global financial system, whether we like it or not. The question is, is it going to exploit humanity or is it going to help humanity? Well, just before we go to the, uh, our audience for questions, there are, I think, six names on here. Yeah. It's a US indictment. Alf yeah. is still in London. What about the rest of them? Where are they? So Mustafa Abdel Wadud, when Arif got arrested, Mustafa was in New York and he got arrested in New York. He, is, he has pleaded guilty, and he's, he's in New York. He's living in New York. Uh, Sev Vetivetpilai is in northwest London. He was arrested when Arif got arrested. He has pleaded guilty. Um, in America, or? He's, he's, the, the, the charges are from the US. So he's pleaded guilty to the US charges, but he's residing in London. No. No. Um, Waka Siddiqui is Arif's brother-in-law. And he was in charge of risk. <laughs> and people, employees at Abraj used to joke, there was like an internal hotline, you know, like a whistleblower line. And employees used to joke if you called the whistleblower line, <laughs> Waka would answer it. <laughs> so another red flag. If a family relative of the CEO is in charge of risk, you might want to have a conversation with the CEO about risk management. Rafiq Lakani, incredibly loyal employee of Arif, the cash manager. He was at his wit's end with stress. He was the person who was moving all the money around. It really affected his health. We believe Wakar and Rafiq are both in Pakistan. We don't know. Ashish Dave, he's the former CFO. He was also a former employee of KPMG. 
Don't know where he is. Might be in India, might be in Malaysia. Don't know. Uh, Sev and Mustafa, who have pleaded guilty, uh, are waiting for the trial of Arif um, to take place. Um, so this is Mustafa, this is Sev. You know, they're all accused of the same, more, no, not all accused of the same crimes, but you know, more or less, you know, many of the similar charges. They've pleaded guilty. Arif was in charge. Arif maintains his innocence. Um, if and when Arif, if Arif, if there is a trial, uh, it's possible that Mustafa and Sev would be witnesses for the prosecution. And if there was then, you know, a conclusion to that trial, they may be sentenced and the time that they have been, you know, on bail would be counted against their sentences. But that calculation can only happen if and when there's a trial. And so, you know, they're in limbo. They're well, in limbo. The audience is in limbo because they've got thousands of questions they want to ask. This audience has always got questions. So please put your hand up if you have any question about the key man. Right? David, you do it. You choose. It's up to you. I hate having a choice. That's terrible. There you go. Thank you. In your opinion, did Nakvi start a branch to commit crimes? Or was he just incompetent enough he had to commit crimes to cover it up? So this is one of two questions which I'm always asked. And my answer to you is, you know, we spent years factually reporting this book. It is a work of journalism. We've told the story in a way which we hope and believe is highly readable. It's a work of journalism. And... I'd like the readers to decide the answer to that question. I'm slightly avoiding the question, but not entirely. I, I'm, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm not a judge. Uh, and we've tried very hard to report this story, very, very complex story, unfolding in multiple jurisdictions, multiple documents, multiple sources, lawyers everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Apparently, I've discovered there's lots of lawyers in the world. And probably, you, and probably watching online as well, should I say? So, well, yeah. Could I just say that um, what you said about lawyers seems to justify the contention that it's 95% of lawyers that get the rest of us a bad name. But um, <laughs> from, all the, from all the supposed overseers that you've mentioned in here, uh, since publication of the book, what response have you had from any of them to explain or justify their position or, or, or lack of active a action. By overseers, do you mean regulators? No, I mean the, the lawyers, the accountants, the auditors, people like that. Have they come back to you at all? None of them want to talk to me. None of them. Uh, they are in a difficult situation because there, are, there is litigation ongoing. There have been lawsuits against KPMG in the Gulf. Uh, there are lots of lawsuits lots of jurisdictions. Um, I would welcome more of a discussion. We have been criticized. Someone who talks to Apple a lot wrote another book about all of this, saying that the Wall Street Journal and, 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 and me and my co-author have an agenda and are part of a conspiracy. So, you know, there's been a lot of back behind the scenes trickiness. Um, we've tried to do a work of journalism, which has been incredibly challenging. Um, just on the, but you know, lawyers have an incredibly important job, but it has to be done in the public interest, even when those lawyers are working for commercial clients. Otherwise, we have a global financial system where there isn't any justice. Just one anecdote. After a barrage blew up, we went to, we heard that Arif was having an investor meeting at the Langham Hotel, which is a five-star hotel next to the BBC. Very expensive. It hired out the ballroom, and there was like, you know, a horseshoe table, right? you know, 20, 25 investors. And he told them that money had gone missing from their fund. And this is in the book is where it's, I met one of the investors 
at Boots at lunchtime <laughs> in the row of toothpaste, and he told me what was going on. He told me very factually, and like, I'm like, he taken hundreds of millions of dollars of your money. He was like, well, anyway, what Arif <laughs> told the investors at the end of that meeting was, he said to them, you've all signed confidentiality agreements. There's a lot of press interest in what's going on. I was told that he said, you know, if we hear that people have been talking to journalists, then we'll, you know, sue you. At that point, I'm like, well, who's the law working for here? It, There's a question yeah. right at the back. Um, That's a problem. Yeah, so at the beginning, this was introduced as a bit of a grim fairy tale. Yeah. And it's that sort of concept I want to ask about. The idea that you're going to invest in medical care where it can't be reciprocated financially. Why was that perceived through any due diligence, do you think, to be a viable concept when the other businesses he'd successfully managed had been because they had failed for no fault of their own, but because they'd become unpopular, which he'd then be able to make popular and bounce back by how it described to me? I'm just curious as to where that... It's almost Ponzi scheme-esque. I'm, yes. I'm giving you this, I'm giving you this, it will work, it will work. Yeah. And how did, how did that manage to be swept up by so many? Excellent question. <laughs> it was swept up, but not necessarily by so many. But it was quite a small bubble of very wealthy people, right? And, and they meet at Davos. So at one press conference, wait, wait, Davos one year, there was a another one of these televised panels which was to discuss global health care. And it was sort of pitched as how can we solve problem of global health care poverty. But on the panel was, was Arif, the CEO of Abraj, and three other people. One was the CEO of the Gates Foundation, another was the CEO of Medtronic, another was CEO of Philips. So they, this was Abraj and three of its investors. This wasn't a panel, this was a press conference. And they were very excited and they were making this pitch. Uh, but if you're gonna have a panel on global health care, you might want to have some doctors from developing countries <laughs> or some nurses or even some patients. And, it, and if you did, we might have a fuller, more accurate conversation. So you know, one of the conclusions in the, in, 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 in the epilogue of the book is that you know, if we have conversations about the global economy or about poverty, and there are no people participating in those conversations who live on, on low incomes, or people who are poor, then those conversations have as much integrity as a room full of men talking about gender equality which is to say they have no integrity. And this goes on a lot in finance because you get these bubble conversations. I do believe that capitalism and capitalists have an important role to play in the world, but we need to have healthier ecosystems for conversations with people from different socioeconomic groups participating in the same conversation. We're starting to see conferences about inequality. I saw one where, I can't remember exactly who it was, but it might be the CEO of John Lewis, who was an important person, but how about have some employees of John Lewis participate as well? You know, we need to have richer, deeper, broader conversations about the world to get accurate information so that viable investments can be made. On the healthcare fund at Abraj, the CEO told me he'd gone to a, hotel, a hospital they were building in Lahore. He'd looked across the fields around the hospital, it was in the outskirts of Lahore, and he saw poor farmers plowing fields with bullocks. And he'd said to himself, it's such a shame they'll never be able to afford to come to this hospital. I'm like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> And then, you know, I found we received, you know, emails from within a barrage that are in the book where executives are talking amongst themselves saying, this fund, we can't provide services to people at the bottom of the economic pyramid. 
the poorest. We can provide services to people at the middle of the pyramid, but not the bottom. It's like, okay, fair enough, but that's not what they were saying publicly. So if we have a situation like that, where at best we have like a bad PR problem, and at worst we've got fraud. And because it was a private equity firm, not a lot of information, not of disclosure, working through tax havens or offshore financial jurisdictions, as they like to be called, there's, a lot, there's no transparency. So it's very hard to get so, information. So we had this thing on due diligence. I think, I mean, and this is even Wirecard. Yeah. Basically, if, if, the, if the anchor investor is a, is a blue chip name, yes. nobody else does the due diligence. Is that, is that what happened here? People saw Gates. There is a, there is a name. the British government. Yes, and they the, thought, well, I don't really need to There do is a word diligence. from this where people do due diligence by association, which is saying famous global megacorp is an investor here. They know what they're doing, so I'm going in. Yeah, well, it wasn't just here. We, we better get to the last question from Martin because we, we have to. Maybe, maybe time for one. Okay, well, not the last question. Martin, quick question. Very short question. What were the assets under management at the time of collapse and how much has since been recovered? So Abraj said it managed 14 billion, about $14 billion. It was raising a $6 billion fund, which would have been the biggest emerging markets private equity fund. It had raised about half of that from investors including Washington Should State, question, Texas Teachers. It said it had a balance sheet of about a billion dollars. The trouble was that its finances are an extraordinarily complex uh, situation of which this is an absurd, sim absurd <laughs> simplification. Um, Investigators found that $780 million had, had been sent out from a barge which shouldn't have left. Um, and about $385 million of it was still missing when it collapsed. Uh, it was, you know, it, it's an extraordinary complex financial situation. Uh, People close to Arif have been saying, look, that $200 million which went missing from the healthcare fund, it was put back at the end of 2017, so what's the problem? <laughs> it turns out that the money was put back, uh, according to a billionaire who lives in the UA, UAE, with money that he lent Arif at the end of 2017. And now that billionaire wants that money back from the healthcare fund. So... So there's this very, very complex sort of bankruptcy situation, it's, which makes it hard for me to give you simple numbers, like X is missing and okay. it's here. One final question. Sorry, I hope it's good. Um, so we talked a little bit about the due diligence and the fact that this is um, kind of hailed as a, an ESG fund. But typically when you're investing in kind of these sorts of uh, projects, you know, hospitals and whatnot, there are social impact assessments you're supposed to do, you're supposed to, you know, environmental assessments, that sort of thing. That's a level of due diligence as well that usually governments require. Yeah. Where was that? And, and did any of the funds like the Gates Foundation actually look at that on top of the financial? So Abraj was producing various social and environmental impact reports. Uh, it clearly wasn't enough. Um, it was an early mover in this space as well. I mean, they were very early to the game of pitching themselves as stakeholder capitalists rather than shareholder capitalists. So in around 2019, there's a US Business Council of CEOs, they, they made this big statement about we're going to do shareholder capitalism now. We care about customers, employees, as well as shareholders. You know, Arif had made that statement, I think, more than a decade before. And, but the, the issue, there wasn't a lot of proving what you were doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, there wasn't, there wasn't enough due diligence here on, on any level. Well, I hope when people leave the library mistakes, they have a new question, something else to learn, a new red flag. So 
there are about 10 here. The one that springs to mind is, are you in any way related to a member of the risk department? Which is <laughs> clearly one, one that I'd never even thought of before, but it's clearly really very important, isn't it? So, or, uh, or have you received an email from a whistleblower yeah, saying that... Saying it's a fraud. It's yeah, a fraud. So, you know, subtle, subtle sort of things yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like that. Simon, it's been brilliant. So Simon's going to rush to the back of the room and sign books. And uh, there's not many left, but he's going to go and sign those. But... Uh, it is an incredible story. It is, in my opinion, Hans Christian Andersen, but with casualties. And as you point out, not just casualties amongst the investment community, but casualties for the world's citizens. So I think uh, as citizens, we owe you uh, a round of applause simply for writing it, but particularly for coming here and talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much.